السلام علیکم خواتین و حضرات وسیم حسن ویلکم سی یو ٹو دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان وی آر گیٹنگ ان ٹو لیکچر فورٹی فور آف برانڈ مینجمنٹ ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو فور دی ایریا وی آر ڈسکسنگ ہیئر از برانڈ پلاننگ برانڈ پلاننگ ہیز سک دا تھری ڈسٹنگ اسٹیپس دیر آئی اسٹارٹ ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ ان دا پریویس لیکچر آئی واز ڈن ود دا فرسٹ ون وچ ریلیٹس کارپوریٹ اسٹریٹجی کے اینڈ برانڈس which is all about the treatment the brands must get at the topmost level of the corporations. And I was talking about the, the second part of the, the planning uh, process when um, the time ran out. And that uh, the particular part is uh, the, the brand planning itself. Market analysis is the, the topic within that area that I was talking about. And uh, under that uh, subject, it is the drivers of change that were at hand in the previous lecture. So let us continue from the very left. There are different forces of change and uh, the dominant forces which uh, cause changes uh, in your uh, uh, the market makeup and uh, the competitive adjustments uh, are the ones I started talking about in the previous lecture. And uh, the two dominant forces that I talked about were the change in uh, the long-term growth of the industry, the meaning an upward change or a downward change. And uh, the second dominant force which really um, affects companies is uh, the change in use of the product, the meaning the who your customers are and uh, the what is the, the change in the use, meaning the way they use the product and uh, what is it that really causes that change. The meaning if uh, we have a dominant uh, driving force, under that force, what really is it, what becomes the driver? The third dominant force, which uh, really uh, forces companies to bring about changes uh, in their uh, competitive behavior, uh, the reason I call uh, the competitive behavior or competitive adjustments is because we all are part of the market, and uh, we all are the players within the market. And since we are pitted against the one another, uh, we are competitive in nature. So whatever moves that we undertake are known as competitive moves. So let's look at the uh, competitive adjustments which are caused by these uh, the dominant forces. Product innovation is uh, another uh, the dominant force which uh, brings about changes. And uh, this is a dominant force which uh, is basically created by uh, the manufacturers. Uh, what happens is that uh, there are industries in which the manufacturers are so innovative uh, because of the, the market pressures, the meaning the competitive pressures, and uh, because of the technical expertise they have at their disposal that uh, they keep on innovating their products at a ferocious pace. And uh, because of that, what happens is the markets grow faster, um, industry uh, grows faster, and uh, the uh, level of uh, the differentiation gets wider and wider. And uh, because of these factors, the net result is that uh, the perception of the consumer gets reformed. So when you are the part of an industry which is growing fast, uh, I mean, the market is growing and uh, the manufacturers also are growing. And uh, you happen to be one of the suppliers to one of those manufacturers. You've got to take into consideration uh, the, all the, the competitive adjustments um, in relation to your own posture. This is just a hypothetical situation. You also could be the, one of the manufacturers that are uh, the part of the uh, group uh, the causing uh, uh, that force uh, which is uh, translating into uh, so many changes within the industry. The fact remains that uh, you've got to be mindful and very sensitive to all the uh, changes and the dominant forces uh, which have the potential to uh, bring any changes uh, that may require uh, adjustments on your part. Another dominant force that uh, we should talk about is the market innovations. Market innovations take place in the form of a newer kind of delivery. And marketing people get into creative methods of distribution only to improve their uh, the costs and improve uh, the uh, relationship between the product and the customers. 
um, and uh, to make the product more customer friendly, so to say. And uh, when that happens, it really changes the whole landscape of the market. If you think that uh, something of that sort is uh, taking place within the market that you are a part of, that you've got to take that into very serious consideration. If you think uh, that somebody has been very ingenious and uh, the actions on the part of that particular uh, the manufacturer have not really translated into um, heavy impacts, then uh, you may ignore it for the time being. But uh, any competitive adjustments which you think that should be brought about have to be brought about in response to the changes which are taking place in the market. Be very alert all the time. Another uh, the dominant force that uh, you must consider during your uh, the planning process is the, the entry or exit of firms. You are uh, the part of an industry which is uh, the peaceful in the sense that uh, it is very steady in its growth and uh, the number of players is uh, uh, well established. Um, and all of a sudden what happens is uh, a foreign company with a lot of resource that enters your market and uh, that creates, first of all, ripples which uh, get translated into something really drastic and very cataclysmic. When that happens, uh, it really affects the cost structures and uh, the, the marketing structures within that particular market. Because uh, in most of the cases, uh, big companies uh, have the potential to bring uh, costs down. And uh, that is uh, the one thing which really makes them big. In that situation, you've got to study the, your market and the moves on part of your uh, the competitors very carefully because uh, the, all the competitive adjustments uh, that are to be made are going to uh, form the basis of your future movements. And uh, therefore, any of the major impacts could have to be taken into very serious considerations. So by the same token, if uh, due to certain reasons, um, one player or a couple of players within the market are exiting uh, due to the very pressing uh, the dominant forces, they just cannot uh, sustain themselves. Again, you've got to make certain competitive adjustments. You may also face the, the brunt of the situation just like they faced or that may, all, may provide you the kind of an opportunity to fill the gap, whatever gap that is. It uh, could be kind of a narrow dwindling gap you know, because of the uh, declining market in that uh, the situation. But whatever the situation may be, if you think you can uh, the capitalize on that situation, you've got to make um, the competitive adjustments accordingly and uh, the craft your uh, strategic moves or the executions accordingly. Another example could be that of uh, a manufacturer from uh, the different category altogether, meaning a manufacturer who's operating in a different category uh, but is very resourceful and uh, tempted by the growth of uh, your market, he decides to become a part of that and uh, having uh, a lot of brand power uh, in uh, his original market, he jumps into yours, causing a lot of changes. So you've got to take into those drivers into consideration if um, the entry of this kind of a resourceful uh, player really changes the, the rules of the game. The strengths that you have have got to be exploited. The, the weaknesses that you may have have got to be eradicated and so on and so forth. The strategic process has got to be considered accordingly. That's the lesson. Another uh, the change, um, uh, the meaning, uh, the driving force uh, that really changes the, the market and uh, uh, necessitates uh, the competitive adjustments is the change of uh, lifestyle. Let's take the example of uh, the anti-smoking campaign you know, all over the world and uh, you will know uh, what this uh, really means. This uh, driver of change you know, has really brought about you know, the drastic adjustments you know, within the strategic movements of uh, all those you know, manufacturers who are dealing within the smoke market. 
Uh, let us talk about uh, another rugged example uh, in relation to our lifestyle. Uh, when we talk of uh, things like uh, the high level of uh, salt and sugar and uh, chemical additives, customers have become so sensitive to all these things uh, because of the health concerns that uh, the manufacturers really have to bring about changes um, into the uh, positionings of their brands. And uh, while talking about uh, the positioning and the, the change in positioning, uh, let me uh, draw your uh, attention toward uh, the factor uh, which really stands out uh, when we talk of positioning, the factor of what it is not. You will recall, it is because of that factor that uh, the manufacturers start talking about no added sugar. They start talking about no additives at all or this product does not contain a high level of salt, so on and so forth. So these are the, the social concerns which uh, you people have to address uh, through the, the inner core of your brands and uh, then communicate with uh, your customers accordingly. And it is this uh, the driving force which really forces the people like you to bring about changes in your positionings. And uh, this is not a small force. This really has uh, a lot of serious repercussions. Look at uh, the, the increased uh, the level of interest the people are having in um, physical fitness. Uh, that has given rise to you know, so many different markets. Uh, the markets relating uh, the exercise machines and uh, the markets related to uh, the mountain bikes, for example. So when you are a part of uh, those markets, you have to uh, think about the, the competitive adjustments which you should bring about in relation to your channels, just to give you one example. What is important about this uh, driver is, or this uh, the driving force is, that uh, you should be able to uh, develop a, a relationship between the changing uh, the social concerns and uh, the, the changing uh, trends. Uh, that are caused by uh, these uh, the social concerns and then uh, be in a position to uh, capitalize on those. Uh, quick uh, responders uh, always seem to be the winners because uh, they know uh, when to take advantage of uh, the changing concerns. So with the help of examples that I've given you, you should be very clear about uh, the dominance of this particular uh, driving force. Having talked about uh, the uh, driving forces or the drivers of change, let us now talk about the link that uh, we should establish uh, between uh, the driving forces and strategy. Uh, there's a very close link uh, between the two uh, because uh, the strategy has to be driven by uh, the driving forces uh, the prevalent in the marketplace and uh, a strategy uh, that's got to be a reflection uh, of all those uh, the forces uh, which um, shape up the market. Unless the managers can really assess the changes which the driving forces are causing within their markets, they cannot really have an insight for the immediate future. And the immediate future is like a period from one year to three years. They will not be in a position to plan well for that future unless they know what is the impact of those driving forces. So in other words, the managers have got to identify those forces in the first place and in the second place, they must look into the implications that those forces have for their businesses and then relate the two in order to make their brands a success. But once managers could have identified those uh, the driving forces, the next question which uh, comes to their mind is, or the next step you know, which they have to undertake is about those um, factors uh, which uh, become very critical or which become you know, key factors toward bringing about those changes. So in other words, what we are talking about is in the first place, the uh, driving forces uh, and the drivers which are causing change and then you see that we are now going to talk about uh, those factors which are very critical for the companies to uh, make um, adjustments in order to respond to those changes. These uh, the critical factors are known as uh, critical success factors. These are also known as uh, key success factors. So the terminologies mean just about the same thing. 
what are these uh, key success factors uh, given any setup uh, we have to learn those uh, key success factors uh, are those uh, strategic elements like uh, the product attributes uh, financial resources human resources your competencies and your uh, the competitive capabilities and other uh, the outcomes which really make a difference between a profit situation and a loss situation. These are the key success factors which really enable you to respond to the changes. And when you respond to those changes, you respond to those changes with the help of your human resource, uh, with the help of your financial resource and uh, the competitive capabilities. And uh, there's so many other related factors which uh, uh, enable you to sustain your the business. Businesses have to pay a lot of attention to all those factors in order to succeed financially and uh, the competitively in the marketplace. As a matter of fact, if a business can answer uh, three the basic questions uh, about the industry, the answers they will lead the companies uh, to assess its uh, capabilities in terms of uh, all those key factors uh, which the company needs to have in place uh, to respond to the uh, driving forces. Answers to these questions, in other words, are going to draw a relationship between the factors of the success and the driving forces which are to be addressed in order to stay competitive because you can stay competitive only if you respond to the changes caused by those driving forces and you have to have certain key success factors to be able to do that. The, the first question is, uh, on what basis customers could choose uh, between the different brands or different sellers? This sounds like a very familiar question, and uh, this may also sound like a very basic question which you ask in so many different contexts. But here you see that you've got to ask this question uh, in order really to ascertain uh, whether or not you really have the, the basic capabilities in terms of your competitiveness, in terms of your resourcefulness, meaning human resource and financial resource, and in terms of all those uh, uh, strategic factors that you have to have in place to succeed in the market uh, financially and competitively, like I said. A very important question to answer. The, the second question which you must ask about the key success factors is, what is it that a seller has to do to remain very competitive? The meaning, what are the resources and competitive capabilities that uh, really make uh, someone very uh, competitive? The third question is, what is it that a seller has to do to sustain that competitive advantage? So, whereas the question number two that addresses uh, your competitiveness through resources, the meaning, the human resource and financial resource, and um, your other strengths that really uh, give you a lot of uh, the competitive capability in the market. The third question addresses your ability to maintain and sustain those capabilities. And uh, you answer the question in a way which tells you what is it uh, that it takes to maintain those abilities. Because maintaining the competitive advantage is something which is going to give you uh, strength in the market. Keep in mind that uh, key success factors are uh, the industry related. Uh, the meaning those are the ones which uh, could be the taken uh, advantage of by the industry as a whole or by those players who really are very sensitive to those uh, factors. The meaning those players who are sensitive in terms of responding to the driving forces of change. And uh, let me explain uh, this concept with the help of an example. You are uh, the part of an industry uh, which is uh, huge and uh, which is voluminous. Uh, the high volumes are being sold uh, by all the, uh, the major competitors. It is uh, an industry uh, which is uh, characterized by economies of scale uh, because uh, you cannot achieve um, good profitability uh, unless uh, you go for uh, the very high volumes. And uh, unless you really can achieve those economies of scale, because everybody is going for volumes, maybe you're selling something you know, which is uh, consumer consumable and the, the selling price of which is not very high. So in this situation, the kind of strategy that you should craft, you should, you should be clear about that by now. 
Do you think a strategy that deals with a niche market is going to work here? No, not at all. You've got to come up with a strategy which deals with you know, very high volumes and uh, that therefore deals with um, the channels which are compatible with selling high volumes and uh, the deals with um, a level of communication which you require in order to reach your customers. If you come up with a strategy which looks beautiful in terms of uh, the words and in terms of uh, its statement, uh, but really is uh, based on something uh, which uh, should belong to a very small, uh, specialized kind of a market, uh, then it is going to be at odds with the market that you are a part of. So by the same token, uh, I give you another example of uh, the market uh, which is very highly specialized and uh, you are a part of that. Um, just think for a while that uh, you are um, a producer uh, producing high fashion garments. Now uh, when you're doing that, a strategy that deals with uh, very high volume basic garments like t-shirts is really going to be at odds with the strategy that you really need in this kind of a situation. This is a situation in which you have to have a strategy that deals with uh, something very special. And uh, while taking care of that strategy, you have to think of uh, the very special stuff in terms of uh, selection of colors at the start of every season or in terms of the fashion design which is very basic uh, to the segment that you are dealing with and uh, not something you know, which uh, deals with uh, run-of-the-mill uh, the products. So the strategy that you have to have here uh, in this situation uh, has to stem from the specialized nature of the segment that you are dealing with. That may have its uh, repercussions in terms of channels. Well, as a matter of fact, it certainly will have, and it must have. You might start thinking in terms of uh, having your own stores, because uh, it is uh, with the help of uh, the company-owned stores that uh, you really can bring the positioning of your brand to life. You are going to have um, the same brand name for your stores. You are going to go for a compatible decor of the store and uh, thereby creating an overall aura and ambience uh, which uh, is very uh, compatible with the, the positioning of the brand. And hence, not being uh, dependent on uh, chain stores or those supermarkets uh, that sell everybody else's brands. So just look at the, the implications uh, of uh, the strategy which uh, uh, you must be aware of in relation to the key success factors and um, in relation to the uh, responses that you have to have to the driving forces. The example of uh, having the right uh, kind of uh, the human resource uh, explains it all. So if you are uh, devoid of certain resources which uh, are not really in line with uh, your uh, strategic thinking, uh, there's going to be a gap between uh, the positioning of the product and your actual capabilities. So uh, being you know, very good managers, you've got to uh, make sure that uh, every, everything falls in uh, line. Make no mistake about one fact that uh, you're not the only one player within the industry. Uh, you have other players, meaning other competitors, and uh, it all depends who is uh, quicker in responding to the changes uh, before others, meaning who's the one who really can uh, muster uh, these um, success factors and uh, then be in a position to respond to all those changes. And uh, knowing that uh, there is a very close relationship between these factors and uh, the driving forces, uh, I would again draw your attention toward the fact that uh, the key success factors are uh, industry related. And uh, because of that nature, uh, those factors are not the property or are not the monopoly of one particular player or one particular uh, marketing company. So those players that are in a position to the more quickly identify the key success factors in comparison with their competitors 
are always the better off. Uh, they are the players who are very sensitive to the changes that are taking place in the key success factors because of the changes in the driving forces. So in other words, the driving forces also change from time to time. And whenever a change within the driving forces take place, that also leads towards a change in the key success factors. It is not that uh, a set of key success factors applying to our situation today is going to also work, um, say, three years down the line. That may not be the case. Uh, let me explain this uh, with the help of uh, an example. Global economic changes serving as an important driver may bring one industry into your country and uh, hence could make it uh, very important for you to look for certain uh, the key success factors. What has happened is all of a sudden that uh, there's a lot of demand pressure in terms of uh, making that particular product or those products which uh, are now going to be manufactured in your country. And like I said earlier, this has taken place because of the global supply chain which uh, uh, keeps making so many different countries as the part of uh, the overall links within the globalized um, mechanism of purchasing uh, the different branded products destined for one particular market. So uh, what happens is that uh, the pressure in one particular country builds up and uh, then uh, so many manufacturers uh, jump uh, into the arena and uh, when that happens the, the problem of uh, human resource comes in. So you are looking at the human resource or the lack of it as the, one of the key success factors uh, in relation to your industry. You think to yourself that in order to be successful in this particular industry, given the fact that we have all of the resources, meaning financial resource and the technological resource, and of course the uh, orders which are going to be offered to us because we are going to be the part of the overall global supply chain, orders will keep coming. We only have to execute those. And for that, the most important or the most critical success factor is the availability of the right staff in terms of management and also in terms of labor. And this is what really happened to the apparel industry of our country. All of a sudden, when the demand pressure built up and we were supposed to be making so many quality apparel for the buyers in the Western markets, the weed and short of the human resource. And the manufacturers were really running around like a scared rabbit looking for um, the right uh, human resource, which was uh, very scarce. So this is one example of uh, the key success factor uh, which uh, pops up um, as a result of um, a driving force, uh, which uh, is uh, the global supply chain. This is one example. So to summarize this, um, I can say that uh, the managers have got to stay very sensitive to all the key success factors which they must be able to identify and then uh, uh, capitalize on those. Let's uh, take a uh, look uh, at uh, a long list of uh, the key success factors which a company should consider before making its uh, or while making its strategic moves. Let me also make it very clear at the beginning of uh, this list that uh, the key success factors which are real you know, keys to the success of a company uh, mostly are never more than uh, a couple in number. Um, it could be just one factor or it could be like you know, two factors. It is not that you really have to have a dozen factors in order to succeed. There are many things which are given and which are very basic and which uh, that have to be taken into account that while you operate within one particular market. But then there are certain changes that which really that make it important for you to look for those factors that which uh, have to enable you to respond to those changes. Back to the list, let's uh, see what that is. It could be the low cost production efficiency. 
So in other words, you can say that in order to be successful in our industry, uh, we've got to achieve uh, the low cost of production. Otherwise, there is no way that we can um, sell our product and uh, still make certain profits. So obviously, uh, this uh, has to be a company, uh, which is, uh, this has to be an industry uh, with uh, the very high volumes. The second factor is uh, could be quality of production. You are operating in a, in a market which really requires uh, the very high quality and um, it is a key success factor. In other words, if you cannot really come up with uh, a meaningful level of differentiation supported by the uh, relevant quality, you cannot succeed. So this is a success factor. Another one is uh, the access to the adequate to the supply of labor, access to the adequate supply of managers. These are the very important factors. And I just gave you one example in relation to global supply chain. Other um, factors uh, that could be like uh, the owning the, your own stores and owning your channels, uh, the, so to say. Fast customer service could be a key success factor. Uh, attractive uh, styling and packaging could be a key success factor. You might um, talk about this factor because you know that your market in relation to your product is uh, so much conscious of uh, the styling uh, because you're dealing with fashion, for example. Uh, you're dealing with certain packaged products uh, in which styling, again, is very important. So uh, you may take this uh, into consideration. I mean, you must take that into consideration. Another uh, the key success factor uh, could be perpetual advertising. Why do you think uh, the certain the manufacturers could get into advertising and remain into the advertising uh, the whole year? Because it is one of the key success factors. Huge volumes and a lot of competition, uh, a lot of entrants within the market, and therefore a vital need to stay ahead of others. And uh, you tell your colleagues who are not from the marketing area, uh, listen, this really is one of the key success factors. If we do not do that, we cannot uh, make our customers retain the message and hence make it 100% uh, sure that the next time they will go for the action desired on their part. So there could be you know, so many uh, the different key success factors of which a few that I have uh, uh, talked about because of the paucity of time. Uh, the objective is that you've got to be very sensitive to all the changes which are taking place in the market and you got to identify the drivers which are causing those changes and then you've got to identify and capitalize on all those factors which you think are the key to attaining success in the light of the changes that are taking place. So much for the market analysis and we get on to the third step of the second phase which is the uh, planning process and this step is brand analysis you get into a comprehensive brand analysis uh, while you are working with your planning for the brand. The brand analysis starts with uh, the brand model and that is something which uh, really does not uh, need a lot of discussion uh, because um, the planning process starts with uh, an understanding on part of the top management about the, the brand essence and the brand model and uh, the, therefore it has to the trickle down in terms of the understanding and then in terms of uh, the strategy making and uh, strategy execution. You've got to, uh, to be very correct in terms of the model and uh, thereby meaning about the essence and the values which your brand is going to offer and you must talk about that. So in other words, the, the personality and the imagery and uh, the, the brand identity which you are trying to create uh, must be recognizable instantaneously. This basically is uh, the, the prime objective of uh, the brand analysis and therefore you've got to talk about uh, the essence and the values in a little more detail. Uh, you talk about all the dimensions uh, but you talk about those dimensions in relation to the uh, capabilities of execution. 
You also talk about the, the communication media, which is going to be put together, uh, preferably in a very integrated form. You will recall the, the importance of uh, the communication and uh, the integration of uh, all the tools that you have at your disposal. And you've got to make sure that the message which you are going to create has got to be very coherent all along the campaign. So these are uh, the kind of um, uh, elements that you must take into consideration when you are analyzing your brand and uh, you have started your analysis with the, the brand model. That is what I talked about. You must be uh, very clear about the, the positioning of your brand. And this, again, is something which uh, goes without saying uh, because uh, this is uh, something around which all the strategies of uh, the, the marketing process and rather other processes revolve. The, like the brand's essence, the core values, the identity and the personality, and uh, the imagery and uh, the all other uh, strategic considerations that have to stem from the, the positioning of the product. So unless you are clear about the, the positioning, uh, you are not going to get into the areas of uh, the segmentation and differentiation in the, the right most way. As a matter of fact, I'm talking about uh, the importance of positioning here because uh, while you analyze your brand, you have to come up with uh, the statement of strategy that talks about the level of differentiation with which your brand is going to offer to your customers. And uh, with the help of that differentiation, you are going to occupy that position into the minds of your customers. And that happens to be the prime, prime objective. So much for uh, positioning in the context of uh, the brand analysis and uh, the rest uh, you all know. The next step uh, the while you analyze your brand is uh, objectives. Uh, this is an area uh, which uh, really deals with uh, the numbers. You've got to talk about uh, the numbers uh, which you are out to achieve. And uh, you talk about the plan period like uh, the year one, year two, year three. And um, projections in terms of the, the sales forecasts um, that uh, you uh, agree with uh, the salespeople and uh, that you envisage achieving at the end of the period. You also talk about uh, your competition in this very context because uh, you do take into account the volumes which are enjoyed by, uh, if not all of the players, at least the major players. And uh, you do take into consideration their uh, market shares, respective market shares, and uh, compare those with the yours, uh, the way it looks like at the end of the plan period. You also talk about uh, the growth factor of the industry and uh, the market, in other words, um, like uh, how many percent the market has been uh, growing over the past so many years, meaning what have been the trends of uh, the growth. And on the basis of that, you make your extrapolations. And uh, based on that, you end up with certain numbers relating your to the market share and uh, high market share with the Y high and low market share, Y low and so on and so forth. But the area primarily relates numbers. After you have taken into consideration uh, with your numbers, the next step is the development of the brand's picture. It is not that I'm talking about all these elements over and over again. This is an effort on my part to take you uh, through the planning process as it is going to take place uh, while you are on it. What is the brand's picture? The brand's picture is uh, in the context of the planning process, the combination of the creative elements like uh, the brand's vision, uh, the brand's promise, and brand's contract. Here, while you go through the planning process, you've got to put down in writing in a very well-structured way what the, the picture is and uh, what are the, the set of uh, the promises that you are uh, the planning to deliver to your customers? And uh, based on uh, those promises, what is the contract which comes into being? And the, the basic objective is to elaborate all the strategic elements uh, in relation to uh, the, uh, the picture and contract uh, and to make sure there are no gaps and whatever you plan is very consistent. 
because uh, if you come up with uh, something very consistent, you are going to only uh, legitimize the, the planning process and uh, the, the brand's position, so to say. So the fact is, if you are uh, talking about uh, a set of promises uh, that can be delivered, you are uh, making sure that uh, you can deliver the contract. And uh, when you see yourself in that kind of a situation, you are only uh, legitimizing the brand's position. And that basically is the objective of uh, this uh, step of the, the planning process. The next one is uh, the products and its variants. Uh, you've got to talk about the product and uh, all the sizes that you're going to introduce. You also have to talk about uh, the, the who, the what, where factors because uh, if you are selling biscuits, uh, you know there's a pack which is meant for the party time and there's a pack you know, which is meant for the office time and there's a small uh, pack or small sachet which is meant for uh, any time. So this is uh, what is really meant by uh, the, the product and its uh, the variants. The importance of uh, this step also uh, is highlighted when you uh, start talking about getting into the various other segments, meaning when you relate you know, your product with uh, the kind of extensions that uh, you may have to bring about at a the future point in time, which of course is uh, the part of the plan, then um, this really becomes uh, highlighted. And you will agree with me, uh, you've got to talk about uh, the small pack which you do not really have as uh, the part of the portfolio at the moment, but you think it must be brought about um, and uh, introduced on the market, you have to the talk of that variant right now and take that into the planning process. All the, the considerations must uh, the center around uh, the, the brand promise and uh, the contract and uh, hence the, the positioning. So this is something which I'm highlighting again and again meaning the need for you to be very consistent in terms of the, the brand's vision, uh, the brand's positioning, and uh, the, the promise, and the contract. Because wherever you get an answer to yourself, uh, not uh, in line with uh, what you're doing, uh, you uh, are getting into inconsistencies, and uh, you're getting into a planning process, which really is not in line with the overall uh, strategic motives. The next step in the brand analysis is uh, naming. Uh, there are uh, different and divergent uh, views on uh, the naming a product. There are uh, the marketing experts who think uh, there is not much in a name and uh, you can go for any name. And uh, in favor of this argument, they cite so many names which really do not mean much. You look around and you'll find to yourselves that uh, there are so many powerful names really do not reflect the positioning of the brand. So in other words, the other camp uh, is uh, a proponent of uh, the reflection of your uh, the brand's positioning. In other words, you have to have a name which uh, really uh, expresses the inner core of uh, the product. And in doing so, what you have to keep in mind is that the name should not be uh, too broad uh, that um, it really loses the essence of the brand. Uh, or the brand's positioning, and then at the same time, it should not be too narrow that uh, it starts uh, depriving you of the, the possibilities of uh, the brand extension. Uh, you should be having a name which uh, maintains a balance between uh, uh, being uh, uh, close to the positioning and at the same time not being too much away from the positioning. The next step is uh, the packaging. Through packaging, you're going to highlight the, the personality of the brand. Now, packaging has not to be uh, mistaken for uh, the brand's personality. It is an outward expression of uh, the personality, which is based on the inner core, and uh, so on and so forth. What is important is that uh, we have to consider the utility and usefulness of uh, this tool that we have at our hand. While creating the package, you must not overdo it. And at the same time, you must not come up with a package about which your customers might say, well, much is left to be desired. You've got to maintain a balance. 
depending upon the quality of the brand, uh, quality being very relative, you've got to decide the kind of segment that you are uh, a part of and uh, the, the pricing point at which uh, uh, that you have defined for that particular product, you should come up with uh, a compatible quality. Do not overdo it. At the same time, do not underdo it. So that is the, the basic lesson of um, packaging. With this, uh, the, the time seems to be running out, and uh, I shall continue with my uh, next and last lecture uh, with uh, the discussion on uh, the brand analysis. And uh, after having been done with brand analysis, I shall be done with uh, the second phase of um, the, the planning process, which in itself is known as the planning process, and then get on to the final uh, the phase, which is the brand plan and uh, which is the template which you are going to use as an outline for any new introduction or any reappraisal of an existing brand. Allah Hafiz, until that time, thank you very much.